Hi, good morning everyone. It is now 10 o'clock and we will comment in the Q&A box, um, which I will get to and explain to everybody how that can be used throughout the webinar. So thank you very much, um, Gia, for the first comment of the day. Um, so welcome everybody to the WE Roadmap webinar. My name is Anna Kedis Hadid. I'm the Programs Director at the Caribbean Natural Resources, um, or Canary as we are known. We are really happy to be facilitating this session today in what we hope is just going to be one of very many national conversations taking place about the development and eventual implementation of the roadmap for Trinidad and Tobago post team. So we of course wish that we could be having this conversation face to face, but we're grateful for the technology that is bringing us together virtually today. So um, next slide please, Asha. Thank you. Um, speaking of technology, before we move on to more formal introductions, I just want to run over some quick housekeeping rules to help us um, make sure that the webinar can run as smoothly as possible and to maximize participation. So if anybody of you um, know Canary, you would know that we are all about participation, which is challenging on a virtual meeting, but we'll do the best we can. So we want to note that the presentation will be available afterwards. So there's no need to be taking any frantic notes of the slides. We will share it. Um, you would have realized that everybody is muted and your videos are off, um, except for the panelists that will be coming on with their videos and uh, microphones. And this is just really due to um, trying to manage the large number of participants and the limited time and bandwidth that we have. So um, please bear with us on that. We would like to ask that you make use of the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions and comments that you would like to go directly to the panel. So everybody can see what is written here, as you had seen from um, Gia's first comment, and you can feel free to submit your questions and comments at any time throughout the webinar. So you do not have to wait until the official time on the agenda when we will have a panel discussion. Feel free to start putting your questions and comments there now, and Canary is going to be managing that um, and directing panelists to different questions. And of course, participants, we would love for you to also add your comments um, to those questions that are posted there. You will also see a chat function and please feel free to use the chat box to send general messages to everyone. So if you have a specific question or comment for the panel, please use the Q&A function. If you have general messages that you would want to go to everybody, if you want to share links to certain websites, for example, that can be done in the chat box, okay? We'll be issuing a few polls throughout the webinar. Um, please, these will pop up on your screen throughout in the form of a question, um, a simple question, a yes or no answer or multiple choice. Um, don't be nervous, it is not a test, it's not the SCA, it's just another way for us to engage with you and get some feedback on a few key questions throughout. And lastly, if you are having any technical difficulties, there's not much we can do, unfortunately, to troubleshoot um, on an individual level. So the best advice we can have um, for you is to try logging off and then coming back in, which actually usually works. Okay, um, next slide, please, Asha. Okay, so I also wanted to show you the Q&A box here. Um, participants, you have the option of upvoting. So if you see a question in the Q&A box that you were already thinking of but somebody else has asked it, you can just upvote that question by clicking on the little thumbs up symbol and that would move it up in priority. So also if you see a certain comment um, or a question that you didn't think of but you think is very important to be addressed, you can upvote that as well. So that will help um, to prioritize questions and comments throughout. Okay, next slide please. Okay, so some of you may already be familiar with Canary. We are an independent technical nonprofit organization. We've been working across the Caribbean for over 30 years, and our mission is to promote and facilitate stakeholder participation in the stewardship of natural resources in the Caribbean. We work with a wide range of stakeholders, including 
civil society, local communities, natural resource users, governments, and the private sector to achieve our mission. And our work centers around four key themes or programs, resilience, biodiversity and ecosystems, equity, and participatory governance. Next. So why are we having this webinar today? As most of you know, the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago appointed a high-level multi-sectoral committee on the 16th of April to develop a roadmap to outline the immediate to short-term actions, as well as lay a foundation for the medium to long-term actions that the government should take to transform our economy and society. Um, recognizing that this roadmap is such an important document that is meant to guide our country in not only immediate, immediate recovery efforts, but towards real transformative change, Canary strongly believes that the process to come up with this document, this roadmap, should be done in a participatory way that draws on the experience and knowledge that we have across all sectors in the country and from multiple stakeholders. So we know it's not feasible to speak with every single citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, but there are mechanisms and avenues and entry points that we can use to mobilize a greater input into this um, very important document. As one contribution to this effort, Canary submitted initial recommendations to the high level committee and that's what we'll be presenting this morning to you. And the full submission is also available on Canary's website if anybody's interesting, interested in having a closer look at that. Next. Okay, so the aim of today's webinar is to contribute to one aspect of a, really a much broader dialogue about the roadmap in an effort to support the committee and ultimately our government in the development and eventual implementation of this roadmap. So through this webinar, we hope to share with you Canary's initial recommendations on developing an inclusive, sustainable and resilient economy in a post-COVID-19 Trinidad and Tobago. We hope to gather ideas from you, the participants, on opportunities, priority actions, and other concrete recommendations to help inform this roadmap. And we also hope to identify potential avenues for civil society in particular to be more engaged in both the development phase and the implementation phase of the roadmap. So I'll give a quick overview of the agenda now for the webinar. Next slide. Um, after this, I'll be handing over to Nicole Lioto, Canary's Executive Director, who will be presenting Canary's recommended principles and four key messages on the roadmap. This will be followed by reactions from our panelists, and then we'll have time for a panel discussion. So again, please do submit your questions and comments in the Q&A box, and we hope that we can generate some good discussion there. Then my colleague Sasha Jatan Singh, who also sits on one of the subcommittees on transformation, will then give a summary of the key points and talk us through some next steps and we'll close promptly at 12. Okay, so we have um, a very exciting panel with us today. Um, I wanted to introduce firstly Nicole Lioto, who I mentioned is the Executive Director of Canary. Nicole has been with the Institute for 15 years and she brings to the table 20 years experience working in natural resource management across the Caribbean. Um, Nicole has really spearheaded Canary's work on how the region can transform to a more environmentally sustainable, inclusive and resilient economic development model. Um, she is, I would call her, a staunch advocate for Caribbean civil society in having more equitable and effective role in how natural resources are governed and managed. Um, next up, we have Dr. Karen Niles. Um, Karen is a lecturer at the Institute of International Relations at the University of the West Indies, UE. And he's also a member of the Roadmap Subcommittee on Remodeling, Retooling and Transforming the Economy. Karen has worked across, um, I think, every sector, including academia, private sector, government and civil society, in sharing his expertise in how we can transform to a sustainable green economy. And he has particular experience 
as well as the energy sector in respect to transitioning to renewal, renewables. Zakia Uzoma Wadada is the Executive Chair of the Emancipation Support Committee of Trinidad and Tobago. The partnership or Board of Directors. Zakia comes with a wealth of experience um, working with and for civil society and local communities in Trinidad and Tobago and across the region, focused again on sustainable development. She's worked with a wide range of stakeholders at local, national, regional and global levels and again has been a long time advocate for civil society and people participation in decision making. Next up on the panel, we have Akoswa Dardane Edwards. Akoswa is a gender and entrepreneurship specialist. She is um, also quite the entrepreneur herself and does an extensive amount of work supporting others through mentoring rural communities and small and micro enterprises, SMEs, in how to develop more sustainable, inclusive and resilient businesses. Um, Akoswa has authored many books, I think, and her work extends from Trinidad and Tobago to other Caribbean islands and further abroad. Akosu was also an adjunct senior technical officer at Canary, so um, she's kind of our in-house expert on local green enterprises. And last but definitely not least, we are very happy to have Omar Mohammed on the panel. Omar is the Chief Executive Officer of the Cropper Foundation, which is another technical non-profit organization based in Trinidad and Tobago and working throughout the region on sustainable development policy and practice in a nutshell. Um, before joining Cropper Foundation, Omar worked extensively in sustainability education with UNESCO and he's worked with several other UN agencies and continues to work with many civil society partners. His area of expertise is in environmental and natural resource management and business administration. And Omar has been another fellow advocate for sustainable development. And over the past few years, he's really further positioned the Cropper Foundation in this light. So that brings us to the end of the panelist introductions. Um, although we don't have time to introduce every single participant, I did just want to let you know that we have a really nice range of participants representing civil society, government, private sector, academia, and um, many interested individuals. So a uh, really big welcome to everyone. And with that, I will hand you over to Nicole to present Canary's recommendations for Trinidad and Tobago's roadmap. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. I nearly forgot to unmute and use video. Um, really special welcome and thanks for taking the time now. I know you're all very busy um, to spend with us and hopefully uh, we can get a conversation going and, and continuing, continue it with you. So as Anna said, what I'm gonna do is really go through the paper, which is online um, and share some of, of Canary's thoughts right now. And certainly our thinking is there's need for a radical rethinking, reimagining, reforming um, the development path that Trinidad and Tobago is on to address the, the inequalities, the injustices um, that we're facing already and the destruction of the natural environment that's our life support system. Um, the messages we have put forward, the ideas in the paper, are really reflecting um, over a decade worth of conversations with stakeholders in Trinidad and Tobago, with engagement and dialogues around the Caribbean and globally um, in delivery of our mission. So we put these together, really trying to reflect stakeholder ideas that have been fed to us for over the years, even though we didn't have time to do a consultation, we're now starting the conversation. Um, next slide, please. The four messages, um, the four main strategies that we're focusing on, uh, on the next slide, Sasha. Focus on economic development model reform. Um, and as Anna said, 
this needs to be focused on inclusive approaches, building resilience and environmental sustainability. Um, the next message is about governance, which needs to be participatory and interactive. The third message, no, Sasha, good, thanks. The third message is on local development. Um, and the fourth is on protecting natural ecosystems. So all of these messages are really, go back, Sasha, please. All of, okay, all of these messages, um, um, built on a list of principles which we put together. So the principles um, which we have outlined on the principles slide, everybody sorry for the technology issues. We don't all have great bandwidth at home, so Sasha is trying to control it. Sasha, principle slide. Okay, so thanks. So a key principle is really that we need to focus on a people-centered inclusive approach in our economies um, that's green and environmentally sustainable, um, respecting ecological limits. That's a key principle that should be the foundation of our development. The other principle is recognizing the interconnectedness of social, economic, um, and ecological systems. So we really cannot be taking this fragmented approach thinking that our economy does not impact on, on society and our natural environment. The third area, um, the third principle is really looking at what Gia raised, um, really looking at a rights-based approach making sure we're addressing inequalities, dealing with the most marginalized vulnerable groups and really building their security. Um, therefore, understanding that a one size fits all approach is not going to work and we need to really understand and address the needs of each person. Um, finally, final principle, we must go beyond recovery to building resilience. So I think everybody's focus right now is on the immediate, when are they going to release us, when are we gonna be able to go outside and so on. But we need to take this opportunity to really redesign our development pathway towards much bigger resilience, not only to COVID-19, but other risks which we are already facing and likely to face in the future. So now I'll go through each of these four strategies. Next slide, please, Sasha. The first one looks at um, really reforming the economic development model. And this is framed on a number of concepts that have been discussed globally um, for the past 10 years and in the Caribbean by Canary um, in dialogue since 2010. Um, so these are, are ideas around, you might have heard, green economy, blue economy, circular economy, um, sustainable consumption and production, donut um, economics, um, there are all these different concepts um, and I'm showing you right there on this slide the definition that Canary came up with after dialogue with stakeholders in 2010 and 2011. That's the 2011 definition and you see the key ideas of all of this are really uh, well-being of people, that people's prosperity um, and economic empowerment is at the center. Um, ideas that there's equity within generations and between generations, uh, ideas around planetary boundaries. So the economy should safeguard and restore and build our natural capital, not destroy it. Um, efficiency and sufficiency, um, sustainable consumption and production, that we don't need to continually, the greed and the continual wa wanting to grow. Um, we need to understand what is sufficient and, and efficient. Of course, everything is centered around good governance, um, integrated, accountable, and resilient institutions. So all of that is a framework um, that we came up with the following short-term, medium, and long-term um, specific action. Next slide, Sasha. So short-term actions, we propose four actions under this strategy. Um, the first one is ensuring that whatever fiscal stimulus um, takes place, that it contributes to green, inclusive, and building resilience. 
So what that will need is a, a transparent system um, for with criteria, where is this funding going to be going um, to ensure that it does not degrade natural ecosystems. It's low carbon, it targets those most in need and invests in green infrastructure. So we need to have criteria, um, transparency and accountability and reporting on how that money is spent. Um, a clean energy transition in key sectors um, is critical and in particular we're highlighting focusing on rural economic development to try and reach some of the, the marginalized. So things like um, looking at health sectors, schools, community centers, facilities. Um, we can look at clean energy transition there. Reforming the Green Fund for Civil Society has been a long call among many of us. Um, and certainly understanding that the Green Fund can be used for facilitating environmentally sustainable economic development that's inclusive um, is critical. So really trying to ease access of funding, unlock that fund, uh, make it accessible and include looking at things like social enterprise, um, social enterprises which um, are already doing a lot of this work um, and need to be able to access the fund. That needs to be unlocked. The fourth recommendation is removing um, harmful fiscal subsidies. So um, subsidies on imported food, on, on petroleum, and really channeling that funding instead to, to improving food, energy, and water security. Some of these basic priorities. Next slide, please. So in terms of medium and long-term actions, um, on the next slide, um, we're recommending five. There's one, um, and we're going to share all of these references. There's something called the Green Economy Tracker, which is a tool um, that Karen Niles, one of our, our panelists, contributed to development of a draft that Canary hopes to, to hold a, a dialogue with and really have stakeholders in Toronto Tobago use this tool to analyze how can we make our economy more green and inclusive. Um, the second one is looking at natural capital accounting. Um, thanks, Sasha, can you go back? Um, and I know that Omar is going to talk much more about this. The third, medium to long-term action on the next slide, thanks, um, is going beyond gross domest domestic product. Um, that is not a good measure of what development means. We need to come up with New metrics, this is something people are doing a lot of work on globally and Trinidad and Tobago certainly needs to step into that thinking and, and, and move away from purely um, GDP. Um, mainstreaming resilience thinking as a, as a central pillar. So everything in our development decisions um, need to strengthen human capital, um, social capital, or physical capital, or, or natural capital. Um, that, that resilience thinking based on strengthening what capitals we have must be at the center, center of our, our economic development plan. Um, and finally, developing sustainable finance plan and looking at some of the innovative investment models that can fund um, inclusive green economy. Um, things like pub, public-private partnerships where public funds, government funds can be used to, to offset some of the risks that private sector would see in investing in green infrastructure, for example. Um, social and impact investment. And Jamaica has set up an interesting um, supporting nonprofits and, and green enterprises with doing environmental sustainability, addressing social priorities. So there's innovation that could happen in, in financing um, nationally. Next slide, please. The second, um, oh sorry, now we open up. Um, that's the first strategy, the first set of messages. And we have a poll question um, for all of you. So you need to get ready to answer. It's up on the screen now. Do you think that the green blue circular economy is a viable economic development model um, to build resilience to COVID-19 and other social, economic, environmental shocks? So this is your chance to vote. We're giving you 30 seconds to vote. Um, what's your opinion? And then we're gonna see the results live. 
So do you think this is a viable economic development model, rethinking, prioritizing inclusive approaches, environmentally sustainable approaches? My timer. So Sasha, let's see the votes. And 70% of you said yes. So um, not sure 30%. So this is a complicated issue. Um, and we really need to think about it and engage others in conversations, exploring um, how can this be feasible? What are these specific actions that need to be taken? So thank you very much for your vote. Um, we're gonna close that and continue with the next strategy. Um, so the next strategy uh, looks at um, governance. Um, and of course here, what's really important our governance right now is still very top down. Um, there was a lot of call from civil society, a lot of concern that this committee set up by the government was very small and how is it going to really consult um, with citizens. And so there have been some efforts made, um, but clearly we really need to reform how we make decisions, including the decisions about this roadmap and this implementation. Um, there's very siloed approaches, people work in sectors, whereas our thinking in the SDGs needs to be much more integrated and look among the sustainable development goals, interconnections between um, environment, society, economy, um, prioritizing local development, subsidiarity, and what can be done at the local level and not the region, um, the national level bringing all actors to the table, um, bringing civil society, private sector, government, academia, around the table to contribute and making sure we're leaving no one behind, particularly those vulnerable groups. Next slide, please. So that really frames um, Canary's thinking on some of the, the actions we've come up with. Um, and, and the short-term actions here uh, really, we need to, to create or strengthen the mechanisms for meaningful and effective engagement of stakeholders. Um, and I think this experience now, the forced use of online technology should be teaching us something about how can we better continue to use this technology to get input from citizens, to get information out, to be more transparent, to be more engaging. Um, this is a, a critical reform in our governments that, that in our governance that's needed. Um, the second one I really want to emphasize, partnering with established civil society organizations. Many of you on the webinar um, are from very strong, well-established, um, strong performing CSOs delivering results for many years. Um, and how can um, you play a role in really this recovery effort and channeling support in particular to the most vulnerable and people who need it? Um, the third area, I think, is really trying to make sure our decision making is more information based. And we're here, we're not only talking about scientific information, what role can UE play, can UE play a stronger role, but also local and traditional um, knowledge needs to be factored into decision making. Next slide, please, Sasha. In terms of longer term actions, um, the very long talked about local government reform and strengthening. Um, there can be much more focus here. What can communities do? Um, what what can, can citizens do in their community to really have a, a sustainable development approach at that local level and localize the sustainable development goals? Um, and, and fundamentally, in the longer term, we really need to transform our institutions and create partnerships with all sectors of society, um, ways that we can better coordinate across sectors, um, enhance transparency, access to information, accountability, stakeholder participation. Um, here I wanted to mention one initiative which is a regional intergovernmental agreement now being negotiated called the ESCA Zoo Agreement. 
um, which is on strengthening participation, access to information, and justice in environmental matters. And civil society, many of you have joined Canary in calling for Government of Toronto Tobago to sign and ratify this agreement to help strengthen our national legal um, regulatory framework um, for participation, transparency, and environmental justice. Um, and we need to look at things like strengthening our environmental commission, broadening their scope of what they can deal with, um, finding ways that we can better participate in existing mechanisms that the environmental commission has. So there's lots of specific things that can be done um, in the medium to long term to transform our institutions. That's just a few. Next slide, please. So you can get ready to vote again. Um, next, we have the poll coming up. Um, thinking about which interactive governance mechanisms do you think are most effective in promoting partnerships, transparency, accountability, and participation? Um, I think you can only vote once, or can you have multiple votes? I don't know. So, giving everybody a few seconds to vote now. Okay, I think 30 seconds are up. Sasha, can you run the results of the poll? Let's see what people think. I'm really interested in this one. Huh, a big spread, um, fairly even spread. Um, basically what I'm hearing from you guys is that you think there are many mechanisms that could help. Um, so the multi-stakeholder advisory committees, partnerships with civil society, including at the community level, strengthening science policy interface, local government reform. And what I want to remind you to do is to use the Q&A section, put other ideas you have, put other conversations. I see Terry Enns put something, um, and we're gonna be going to this in the panel and kind of enriching the discussion on this and all the areas. So at any time during this, go into the Q&A &A, um, box at the bottom of your screen, if you click it, you're going to be able to put comments. I'm seeing conversation going on. I can't read it now. Um, so thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sasha. Um, let's go to the next slide and look at the third area. Um, so the third strategy that Canary um, thinks can be used in this roadmap is really enabling local economic development through catalyzing and supporting innovation and entrepreneurship. And here we're particularly looking at micro and small enterprises. So there's tons of very um, interesting data on micro and small enterprises um, around the world. I put some there at the bottom of the screen. Um, and, and I just read this morning another study uh, in Latin America and Caribbean, 99% of all companies generate more than half the jobs in Latin America and the Caribbean. That's an OECD study. Um, and that's even higher than global estimates. And you have to recognize all of these numbers about the importance of micro and small enterprises don't incorporate the informal um, enterprises that are not registered at the community level, that are, that are tiny. Um, and this is where the most vulnerable people are working, um, the most vulnerable entrepreneurs who are not getting access to social support. That same OECD, um, OECD study said, 61% um, of vulnerable informal workers don't have access to social protection in Latin America and the Caribbean. So really, um, our, our recovery package, Canary is saying, needs to focus on these micro and small enterprises and not forgetting the informal enterprises if we're trying to address those who are most in need and most vulnerable and most at risk from being further hurt due to COVID-19. Next slide, please. Um, Short-term actions then we think you need, we need to focus on really supporting these uh, micro and small enterprises with business continuity planning. How can they get back their operations um, up and running? Um, second, provide financing. I don't think the government has yet announced um, any financing measures 
um, globally, you're starting to see um, governments are recognizing the importance of the small and micro sector in terms of their, their immediate support just for survival. Um, so we don't want to see these businesses collapse and close down. We want to protect them in this stage, um, but also help them look towards longer term recovery and resilience. Um, scaling up a lot of the existing incubator and investment finance programs we have already need to be scaled up and need to ensure that micro, small and, um, micro and small enterprises also practice this triple bottom line approach. So not only do they need to deliver economic benefits, um, but they also need to be green themselves, practice environmental sustainability, and also ensure that they're delivering benefits to their communities, so social value. Um, the third suggestion we have is as an existing, um, very good micro and small enterprise development policy developed by the Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprise Development many years ago that has been shelved um, with this new government coming in. And we really think that needs to be pulled out, dusted off and looked at. Uh, we do not need to start from scratch in policy development. A tremendous amount of work has been done on what needs to support these, these tiny enterprises with business development, with accessing markets, with financing and so on. Um, as part of that policy, it was recommended to develop a small, a micro and small enterprise council of people. So that, that mechanism um, is there in the policy and can actually be used to then have an advisory group to help guide how the recovery program supports strengthening of this very vulnerable but extremely important sector in the country. So we do not need to start from scratch. Um, and the other fifth recommendation in the short term is really pulling together all of us who already support um, MSEs and trying to develop a more coordinated and strategic response. So there's private sector initiatives, um, there's government programs, there's many civil society organizations also trying to support um, micro and small enterprises. We need to come together and strategize how we can best be, be coordinated and most effective. Next slide, please. Medium to long-term actions, um, of course, we're looking at implementing the policy. Um, so it's dusted off, we need to start to rule that out um, and make the changes happen, uh, particularly in the, the public sector um, programming, of course. Um, and also looking at, at retraining the most vulnerable groups um, to support their re-entry and also taking advantage of new opportunities. I think for me, it's been quite exciting to see um, new businesses, which I was not at all aware of, people are doing um reaching out with food your options of how to get food now are vast um and so really retraining supporting um entrepreneurs to take advantage of of new opportunities and for those whose current jobs and current businesses um may be really shrinking and and, and severely damaged by by the pandemic how can we get them into other opportunities next slide please so now is a poll um, how do you think MSMEs should be supported? Um, here are some ideas we want to hear from you. Do you think it's most important to have capacity building and support services, incentives like tax breaks um, for small and micro enterprises, innovative funding, grants and loans, and strengthening the policy and legal framework? So let's hear from you what you think. And we can't vote, so we need to hear from you. How should we be supporting micro and small enterprises? What are the pri priorities? What are the best strategies we can use? Okay, Sasha. Let's see the results. Ah, again, fairly even. Um, the highest amount feel money. And there's a huge financing gap. There's a very interesting um, data from the World Bank on the financing gap to micro and small enterprises, um, but clearly also capacity building, support, um, incentives, and strengthening the legal framework. 
So really interesting, there are some concrete things we can do and we need to dust off that policy that has been written um, and bring it forward. Um, I'm seeing some good comments coming up on my screen. We're gonna be coming to that. Remember to keep using the Q&A so we can have an, a rich discussion after. So the final strategy um, is looking at natural capital. So economic development um, is really founded uh, largely on natural capital, on our natural ecosystems. And some very good studies um, showing this. Um, the first one I have there is, is a World Bank, um, sorry, a World Economic Forum PWC study, a big global study saying half of global GDP is moderately or highly dependent on natural ecosystems. Um, a World Bank study on the value of the Caribbean Sea, $407 billion per year. That was 2012 data. Um, all is, is increasing. They project that will double by 2050. Um, the, the value of Tobago's coral reefs, some other, we have had, had some economic valuation studies in Trinidad and Tobago. This is an example showing the huge value. Um, and also uh, a recent um, study showing that um, when they did a, a huge global study on what do businesses see at the, the top risk for them, biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse was felt to be one of the biggest risks to businesses. This is by businesses. Uh, one, they depend directly on nature whether it's triggering indi indirect impacts, um, affecting um, regulations or financial performance, or just disrupting society and markets like COVID-19 is now. Um, so really huge justification for paying attention on valuing, protecting, sustainably using and restoring um, natural ecosystems to, to drive economic development and build resilience into the future. So some short-term actions that, that we are proposing um, could be looked at. Next slide, Sasha. Um, firstly, we must ensure that the money put into recovery um, in the short and the long term um, is green, that we don't further degrade natural ecosystems, that we are uh, supporting low carbon approaches and, and sustainable consumption and production. So we should not be financing um, businesses and actions that are destroying our natural ecosystems. That just does not make sense. This is an opportunity to refocus and reorient our, our development pathway through these um, stimulus um, and investment programs. Um, the second one we're suggesting is really looking at, at land use planning, which has been so weak in Trinidad and Tobago for so many years. Um, and we really need to do a better assessment of where are our valuable natural ecosystems that are providing key ecosystem services. I know the Cropper Foundation has for, for long highlighted the value of the Northern Range, recently in the River Swamp, our wetlands. Um, we need to really look at land use planning and development to protect some of these natural ecosystems and the services that they provide us. In the medium to long term, next slide please, Sasha, um, there's some, some innovative budget plan, climate finance tools which can be used. I'm not an economist, I don't pretend to be, um, but there's really innovative work being done, done globally that we can bring into our, our um, economic management system here, here in the country uh, to help reorient and protect our natural capital, which is really our life support system. Um, next slide, please. So we want to hear from you. Um, poll is going to be open. How prepared do you think we are in this country um, to be able to use some of these innovative tools to reorient our economic devel development model to be more environmentally sustainable and inclusive? One is the least prepared and four is the most prepared. So here you're using a scale, um, how prepared you think we are as a country and ready to incorporate some of these new approaches. I'll give you a few seconds.
And some of this work has been done by the Cropper Foundation. Hopefully, Omar will get a chance to talk about it in the panel. Um, this kind of thinking has been discussed in the country before, but are we ready for the change? Okay, I think people had 30 seconds to vote. Sasha, can you open up results? All right, most of you um, think we're not prepared or slightly prepared. Um, no one thinks we're very prepared. So a huge amount of work to do here to build readiness, um, including at the, the political level, the policy level, um, the technical tools and methods are there, but we're not ready um, as a country. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, and I think that was a walk through um, a lot of talking from me on Canary's paper, which is online. There's tons of references we are going to share after. Very interesting reading. Um, and what we want to do now is open up the floor to our panel, who were introduced already. So I'm going to invite all of them to open up their video and their mic. Um, so on our panel, hi Zakia. We have Zakia, um, Karen, Akosu, and Omar. And please unmute your mics, go ahead. And what I'm going to do is invite them to each give some of their initial thoughts and reactions to, to some of these ideas that Canary has proposed. Um, they may add new ideas or dig deeper, explain things to us, um, add some information for us. And I'm going to go in order. Um, Karen. Um, is really talking about the first priority of really reforming our economic governance model. So let's give Karen um, five minutes to speak. And Karen, is your mic open? It is now. Good morning. <laughs> Go ahead, Karen. All right. So first of all, thank you very much, Kanari, for um, the invitation to share. Um, so as they mentioned, uh, the sake of transparency, I, um, along with Shastra Jackson Singh, I, I would add Shastra Jackson Singh, sorry. Um, yeah, we're members of the subcommittee uh, on retooling and transforming the economy, um, which is looking at questions like development planning um, in terms of how we might need to tweak Vision 2030 and also the larger questions of diversification. Um, of course, my background here is, is I was uh, in management at the Economic Development Advisory Board when it existed, and we focused a lot of our attention and time on questions related to diversification. But if I may, um, allow me to get just a tad, um, I don't know, maybe controversial, uh, or maybe philosophical, you can pick whichever. Um, I think usually people tend not to disagree on on the nice and lofty aims and objectives and principles. I mean, very few people have disagreed that we need to pay more attention to women and girls or the environment. Um, but this is a good opportunity to, to question um, several of our precepts, which is the origin of our concepts, right? Um, and so I think when I hear some of these ideas, I, I always want to question them because it has specific impacts on how we implement policy, right? So let me start with probably one of the more controversial ones, which is this idea that we need to pay attention to these different vulnerable groups of people, right? Um, I found where it looks like, if you take a, look, a nice look back at our history, it seems as though that our international rights framework is, is particularly flawed in two ways. Um, our rights framework seems to be too anthropocentric, which means too focused on humans. And secondly, too focused on the individual human, right? And let me explain what I mean by that. Number one, um, the only reason that we really care about the environment, if we're honest, is because it has negative impacts on humans, for the most part. Like when it comes onto policy, when it, if, um, say for example, um, if climate change only affected animals, um, and there was really no impact on, on humans, like say we were able to scientifically engineer our way out of it, and it only had really negative impacts on a few animals, um, there would be a lot less concern. Um, and I, I, I'm not just saying this off of a whim, right? I, I'm gonna tie it into the questions that I've been asked to answer. Um, the, <laughs> the response 
to slavery was mechanization and technology. And it really caused the industrial revolution to happen, you know, and it was an amazing development. But the movement from human labor to mechanical labor led to climate change, right? And it's not, it's only not everything around say, oh, okay, so we solved that problem, which is focused on mistreatment of people. So another problem now, which is now focused back on the impact it's, it's having on people. The environment always tends to be an afterthought. And also the, 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 the need to always focus in on how it affects the individual, I find really problematic. So now we've had our rights of assembly suspended. There is a lot of uproar and some people even taken, some people even have even taken legal action. And I say all of this because now we're entering a space and time where we're almost being forced to think of the collective and collective rights differently. What does that have to do with diversification? Well, everything. Right now, we are now being flooded. Not just, not just our subcommittee. We have, we've had over, what, 60 submissions, but the main committee has been flooded with lots and lots of different submissions. And what tends to happen is everybody tends to look at their own individual basket, right? So businesses might look at um, their basket. The manufacturing sector looks at their basket. And we have a whole bunch of disparate groups saying a lot of different things that are also we've had um, presentations on gender responsive budgeting and then we're going to have um, presentations on climate sensitive budgeting when in truth and in fact we all need to take a step back and see how we can widen the picture to not just include and I'm going to get a little contribution here maybe but not even just to just include all people but all living things right and so that will include your natural, your natural capital accounting so what that would also include women and girls, that would include men and boys. Um, and and it, it's definitely not to erase historical injustices, but to recognize them. So in, in how I view it is that I've put forward, in closing, I've put forward um, pretty much four principles that I think is really important in terms of how we do this. And those four principles, are, we can talk about them after, because it gives up my time. There's four principles that I think we need to spend more time improving the infrastructure that supports um, the acceleration of e-commerce in Trinidad and the digitization of financial services. And uh, I mean, extending the things like banking to the unbanked and extending e-commerce facilities to a lot of um, micro and small and medium, I think that would really free them. I also think that as somebody, I think it was Nicole intimated to earlier, I think we need to really look at how the, digitiz the digitization of, of government services um, including social service can really be accelerated right? and how we can do what essentially Point Fortin has done in terms of rolling out the digitization of, of government services without removing government too far from the source of the problem because right now what we have is a lot of CSOs that provide that service right, for the government but the problem with that of course and I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that but the problem is that they, it removes the state and it removes the decision maker further from the person with the problem, right? And then the, the third thing I would say is there are two things that need to be integrated. One, uh, environmental cost and benefit. Those need, th those need to be internalized, right? Now they're treated as an externality. I think that should be corrected now. And also something called the care economy, right? Which is the work that women have been doing in homes, large, and sorry, the work that largely women have been doing in homes um, unnoticed for, for like decades or centuries. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that needs to be recognized greater. And so in doing so, I think we need to provide specific support to remote learning and remote work, right? And in, in, I, I can build this out more later, into, but that would also include providing support for single parents at home. And it also causes us to re envision agriculture at home and the environment, even within our own microenvironments. And the final thing, of course, is looking at innovation and, and innovation funding and making funding available, not just for small businesses, but across every single type of business, small, mm -hmm. medium, and large. That's it, I'm done. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Um, I think very thought provoking, both kind of on our philosophical approach and understanding where we came from and some of these drivers, um, and then some very specific practical ideas that can take us forward. So I think you're gonna stimulate a lot of conversation later. Thank you very much. Um, next, I will go to Zakia, who is going to help us um, look at governance. So, Zakia, please. Thank you very much, Nicole. 
and a pleasant morning to all our listeners and our fellow panelists. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to participate and to share what I think is an extremely critical discussion at a pivotal moment in the, our country's development. My view is that at the core of any process or any new way or new road or any pathway is decision making. And what is required here in Trinidad and Tobago is an institutionalized process of stakeholder engagement when with respect to decision making. Now, that is, can be very challenging because, I mean, some attempts have been made to bring NGOs together. You know, government has tried, different groups have tried. So what I would like to propose as the most transparent process that facilitates engagement from the bottom up is this process of decentralizing our local government. Now, there is an, ex an excellent opportunity with the decentralization of government because of structures that already exist, albeit that a lot of it has been politicized. But if we are able, as part of that process of decentralization, to weigh in, we as civil society, and to give some strong guidance, our village councils, for example, can become the, the grassroots space where we, we begin to find out what is happening. You know, what, what, what are the requirements at the level of the, 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 the community which, uh, um, in which that village council exists, the, or the various communities which it serves. At present, our village councils have become politicized. It depends on which political parties in power the village council is controlled. But that was never the intention of a village council. A village council was an opportunity to bring the people of that particular community together to discuss the issues of their community. Within our communities, we have our women, we have our youth, we may have disabled persons in that community, we may have persons who have a concern of the environment. I'm saying that all the different sectors are represented, or most of them are represented in almost each community. And if we are able to transform our village councils into decision-making processes, we even do budgeting at the level of the village council, for example, so that the issue, the, the concerns of that community is served, then we feed up into what we call our corporations or our regional, um, our local, you know, the divisions of, of local government, the different corporations, the different regions, according to how people are classified, whether towns or cities, etc. And then, of course, eventually to the central government. Now, though that particular kind of process allows decision making, even alongside those organizations that would have a um, national organizations would have also which would have also been established around certain issues whether it be women whether it be youth etc so i think one of our key areas of focus has to be how do now this is just a recommendation of course there might be pros and cons and i would really love to hear how people feel but i think it is one of the most transparent ways to engage people but the thing, the, 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 the key remains uh, how, if we are not able to find ways to, to make decisions with appropriate stakeholder engagement, all of these, uh, with all of these values, all of these principles to which we aspire are going to continue to be a problem if, we, if the decision making process is not controlled. And one other point I want to make is that we also need to understand what stakeholder engagement is. That has been one of the, let us say, what, uh, missions of Canary, making us understand what stakeholder engagement is. So that we, we, the, the issues of equity, the issues of justice, all of those things are taken into consideration as we engage people so that we really 
don't you know engaging people is not just appearing you know there are lots of principles that are attached to stakeholder engagement and i think there needs to be quite a bit of capacity building that facilitates that stakeholder engagement so that we can have this more inclusive approach to how we make our decisions and uh, and the development of a pathway that is going to be all encompassing and really facilitate the needs of all our um, citizens. Thank you. Thanks. I've been grappling with that issue of how civil society citizens can be more involved, um, and I think you know. We reach a point, some people are saying the nice words, but we need concrete mechanisms for effective participation, not token consultation, right? And being told what is happening. Um, so good, I hope we circle back to that. Thank you very much. Um, next we have um, Koswa, who is going to talk to us about her thoughts on supporting micro and small enterprises and, and that as a real strategy. Um, for a recovery going forward. So, Kospa, please. Hi, good morning, everybody. And thank you to Canary for convening this meeting. I, um, I wanted to talk about the experience that I've had working with SMEs throughout the years. And what I realized is we, we have taken the approach of walking with a toolkit to each community and each rural business and saying to them, here's the, the toolkit, the toolbox. You take out what you think or, or take what we think that you should use and make your business work. And I think we have to move away from that because it's not a one size fits all. We really have to think about a participatory approach. When we go to the communities, we have to respect the fact that they are already doing something and, and our role is really how we can support that. So from saying that, having said that, I want to suggest a few ways that we can do that. And the first one is how we measure SMEs and, and micro businesses. Mm -hmm. How do we measure the growth? How do we measure uh, expansion? And we use all methods to measure. So for some businesses in rural communities, from zero to 10 is growth. But when we come with the old toolkit, we look at how many employees do they have? So can we now look at a way of measurement that is relevant? so that we can support them better. Because some of them are doing really good work, but they don't want to increase the, their sales in this year for a particular reason, because they don't have the capacity at that time. So if you're saying to them, the only way we will support you is if you increase your sales, you, you exclude them, but they are doing something significant in the community. The second thing is access and access to finance, access to networks, access to facilities, access to capacity building. We still go with that same toolkit. And what happens is, let's say for example, we have in communities systems already set up. Let's go to one, um, I think Nicole talked about the local and traditional knowledge. We have something called the SUSU community and they use that to start their business but when they go to the bank the bank would ask them well where did this, these funds come from so how can we use what is working in the community and help them build on that see a similar thing is Gaia how can we use the Gaia method to assist communities to build their business. Right? They, they've already set a system up. So when we come and we say, you know, go to export TT and go to here and go to there, it's a whole different journey for them. Right? The third thing I want to talk about is the technology gap. 
in rural communities, there's a, sometimes there's a fear of using technology to communicate. So now we have WhatsApp and a lot of people, or almost everybody have a phone. So when they hear Zoom meetings and Skype, and they, they, they put a wall up. So how can we use the things that they have already, which is WhatsApp. I mean, my, my experience has been, as soon as I say I am mentoring you remotely, a wall goes up. Because in their mind, they want to see me. They want to look me in the eye and they want to trust me. And they can't trust me over Skype or Zoom meeting or immediately. It takes a longer time. So that affects the results of what we're doing. So how can we close that technology gap? And that brings me to another point of using mentors and elders in the community. Now, there are communities who respect your elders. So how can we bring elders in the capacity building of building a business? And how can we use mentors to integrate with the, men, with the elders and the, the, the business? And they already do that. So when we come with this toolkit, which has none of those things in there, we scare them off. And then they, they don't want to come into the formal economy because they feel disrespected based on their methods. Right? Um, the, the, the last two points I want to make is time management. And that goes back to what Dr. Peranaz talked about in the care economy. I saw a statistic that between 40 and 60% of households in the Caribbean and in, and, and, and in particular Trinidad and Jamaica are female led. If, we, if we're serious about assisting rural businesses, we have to take that into account because if you're setting up courses, capacity building, and there's nobody to take care of the children or they have to go and pick the children up you exclude them automatically and then you would say they're not taking up the courses that we have there right so we have to think about time management and the care economy we also have to think about equity domestic violence we have to think about equity in terms of who runs the household. We have to think about equity in, in how, we, how we present rural women as business owners because there's an unconscious bias. And as soon as that comes up, even in, in these times, they ask for their son or their husband, it can't just me be this rural woman running a business. So those are my points. Um, I think COVID has presented us with, a, with an excellent opportunity to relook how we do things and, and not to discount what happens in the community because even with things like climate change, you would hear communities saying the flowers, the flowering patterns have changed. And that could be significant in helping us in supporting them in climate change. You hear them say it's not raining as much. And we have big terms for that. It's a drought. You hear them say they catch rainwater and they use the rainwater. And then we come in and say, well, you put up tanks. But they've been doing something. How can we improve on what they have been doing? And I think for us as the ones who want to support these SMEs, we have to not think, we have to not think that coming with this toolbox with things that we learned from school is the only solution. We have to integrate the two and, and respect what they do as well. So thank you very much, Canary and everyone for your points. And I hope that we can build on what I said and, and I'm open to feedback and, and even disagreements. And debate, <laughs> which debate, is what we yeah. want. Yeah, we're not here to all agree. We're here to have a conversation. So, so thanks to Koswan, I really like my take home from your from your um, sharing is really 
you know, this recovery has to be, if it's going to be for people, it needs to be with people and by people. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we are not helicoptering in with our wisdom. You know, we really need to recognize they, they have a lot there. What can we build on? How can we support them? I really yeah, like I mean, you, you mentioned earlier people centered and that's critical yeah. in moving forward. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you very much. I'm very thought provoking. So Omar is our final panel. He's going to share some of his thoughts, um, looking at really how do we protect, restore, sustainably use natural ecosystems as key natural capital. Um, Omar, please. Yeah, great. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Nicole. Um, well, I think like Karen, I think I'm going to start again. And like Nicole, I'm not an economist. Um, I may be an armchair economist, if so much. Um, but I think that whole question about how we value our natural environment. And for those of you all who, who might not know, natural capital is basically your, your stocks of living and non-living things. So your plants, animals, mineral resources, etc. And then from that, like financial capital, you get a flow of resource, flow of benefits and services, like pollination, food, water, etc. Um, and I think the issues that we've had so far, not just Trinidad and Tobago, but globally, is that we've never really maybe cared to um, or wanted to incorporate the actual cost of our use of the environment in, in what we call economic development. And, uh, you know, because the relationships are complex, but also because the existing structures that we had to measure our economic performance, there was never space for the environment. You know, GDP, you know, far less environment it never included, like the care economy, it never included unpaid work, et cetera. So far less the natural capital on which the economy was built. And I think so moving forward, all of these recommendations really sort of hinge on us having a better understanding of what the economic direction of this country needs to be beyond just a bunch of, of packages and, and policies pushed together, um, responding to maybe the immediate um, crisis or the immediate trend um, globally, we need to, to really have a conversation as a country. Again, communities, civil society, policymakers, academics, etc., and figure out what is the development um, pattern that we want to pursue. Is it green, green growth with, you know, the social equity issues that might come with that? Is it degrowth with, you know, the, um, the debt to GDP issues that might come with that? Is it something that moves more towards a, a social equity type of economy, but by itself has issues? And I think a couple of things are clear. The current economic model will not be supportive of environmental sustainability. I think we could all agree on that because as Nicole would have pointed out earlier, you know, we, there are so many frameworks that, that already give us the information that we need. Environmental planetary boundaries, for example, which we already surpassed four, two of which are the, the core critical processes, climate change and the integrity of your biosphere. So the science is there. And I think it's really up, up to us to really try and understand how we now go forward to create a framework in which we put these short-term, medium and long-term um, policies within. Because, and there's no, there's no one size fits all, as Nicole would have said, there's no sort of win-win situation. There will have to be, again, very sort of interrogated discussion around what we want this economy to look like. And in those discussions, it will be our obligation to ensure that the environmental considerations play a central role. Um, because I don't think it's been done enough or at all. Um, we've been obsessed with this idea of growth. Um, you know, the sort of locker room economics type of thing, you know, um, bigger the ship, the better. Um, and that sort of permeated, you know, maybe because our ministers of, of finance have all been male, I don't know. But I think it's something that we have to um, get around and get around quickly. 
And I think there are so many existing frameworks that we can use. So many of them have been piloted in some way in Trinidad and Tobago. You've had, um, you know, pilot carbon accounts. You've had, um, you know, preliminary work on ecosystem service valuation. You know, we know that the main ridge of Tobago provides 7 million US dollars a year in just water provision. You know, we understand that the Northern Range accounts for almost 500 million US a year in seven key ecosystem services. So we have these figures already in place, really now to actually have a concerted apolitical, sorry, not apolitical, but um, non-partisan approach to bringing these things together mm -hmm. and not use the excuse of not having enough information or not having enough data because you will never have enough. I think the, the point is to just start with the data we have. And even just last year, there was a great paper done by Professor Agard and some other colleagues out of UE that shows that with the existing data we have, we could actually have very concrete spatial planning being done. So I think the idea is, again, to just get going with it and uh, to not use the common excuses. Because as, we, as Nicole pointed out earlier, this is just one of many shocks that will be coming um, that will impact on our human system. So, um, yeah, so we can discuss some of these strategies moving um, forward in the conversation later in the webinar. So, thanks so much. Thank you, Omar. Um, and I really love how you, you illustrated very well for me. The science is clear. Um, we have enough data. The tools are there. We've piloted tools. So, so really, it's coming down to a willingness, um, a willingness to come together, to have those conversations and dialogue, develop a clear direction and strategy um, moving forward. Um, I really think that's a very strong point. I wanted to read some quotes from um, a new paper, May 5th, 2020, by a bunch of leading economists. We'll share the reference. Um, um, the climate emergency is like the COVID-19 emergency just in slow motion and much graver. Um, there are reasons to fear that we will leap from the COVID frying pan into the climate fire. So we are focused on COVID-19 now, but there are many other risks. And this issue of building resilience um, to whatever hits us, I, I think is center to our discussion. Um, and, and I want us to focus um, a lot there. COVID-19 is a risk, but we're looking at a resilient recovery pathway. So thank you very much to all the panelists. That was really um, stimulating. Um, I think you have gotten some discussion going on the Q&A. What I want to say is I'm noticing people also using the chat um, instead of the Q&A. So we're trying to keep an eye on both, but feel free to cut and paste stuff into the question and answer section um, as well. Um, that's, the chat is a little harder to follow because you then your point gets lost. Um, but if we look uh, at the questions and answers, I know um, the panelists will also have been looking at that. Um, the top question um, is really about um, how can we convince people to make this shift? Um, uh, the other questions on, on what's needed to really reorient um, this whole development pathway, develop a clear direction. Um, how do we come together to have a strategy for financing? So I wanted to throw that um, maybe first to uh, Karen, um, because you mentioned, um, I didn't like the word tweaking of Vision 2030, but um, you know, do you have any thoughts of, of how can we really um, get this consensus on what our direction needs to be moving forward for recovery um, and sustainable sure. development? So there, there, there are two things that I'll add. Um, uh, and I, I think my answer will just answer the first two questions and then I can be silent and allow other people to speak. Um, I think the, the state's response to COVID-19 was actually largely commendable, it was actually pretty decent um, because of, as a policy response. But I think it was, it was good for two reasons. It was incredibly focused. Like all of government was doing one thing. Everybody had one job, contain the virus. And we had focus brought results. Right? And the other thing that they did was they communicated with people every single day. I didn't actually think I would live to see the day that the government was on TV every single day and people actually listened. 
right? Um, those two things combined with com continuous, um, continuous communication and laser-like focus actually, me, it actually delivered a, a astounding message in my head. If there was an agreement in our direction, it's not like the people that, who are in office are so incompetent that they can't get it done. It's just that I think that they actually are trying to please every single body and they're trying to do too many things at once. So one of the things that I've actually said um, that I don't mind repeating is that I've actually said that I'm not interested in a new laundry list of things that the government should do. I've actually said that to the government directly um, because I think they should choose a direction. And so this question about green and blue economies, it's actually engaging in a useful debate with the state and saying, okay, there are many different frameworks that can take us to where we believe that we need to be as a country. Make up your mind. So if we go in green, blue economy or circular economy, um, it has implications for decisions that need to be made and made and real decisions that they would need to defend to people. You understand? So if you decide that you are going after, um, if you decide that you're going after uh, the green and blue economy and you have, you have three main pillars you have to, um, to satisfy. It has to be socially inclusive, has to be environmentally um, sustainable, and it has to be economically viable. All three. That puts us in a very interesting position because one of the government's objectives is not just to diversify the economy away from oil and gas, but also diversify the energy sector itself, right? But that's interesting because the energy sector, while at one point supplying 80% of our exports and 45% of our GDP, has only really accounted for 3% of GDP. Sorry, it's 3% of employment. It's only accounted for 3% of employment. That's not very inclusive. Right? And so there are real implications for how we make decisions. And they need to be able to, to back that. They need, they, they need to be able to defend it. You know what I'm saying? Which means it's going to cost you, in terms of your GDP, um, at a time where you just lost a lot of money. Another practical example of this, in terms of the real implications, is if you're going after green and blue economy, um, it means that we, can't no, we, we can no longer keep subsidizing energy prices the way that we do, keep subsidizing water prices the way that we do, um, just without a timeline of when they're, gonna, when they're gonna expire. And it would be really hard at that time. And this is one of the things that, like, before we were saying, before this even happened, we were saying, actually, the fact that, that our energy, our electricity prices in particular, are so low is a major disincentive to conservation. And it means people just waste electricity in Trinidad and Tobago, mm -hmm. right? If we want that to stop in terms of environmentally sustainable and meeting that green economy um, indicator, then it means that you need to stop subsidizing the electricity. But definitely, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an immediate post-COVID scenario, no one after massive unemployment and no one is going to be like, touch electricity prices. I certainly not in an election year, right? So... There are real implications of, so talking about the, the, as Omar intimated, the issue is not the science, right? Final example, final example. With regards to, people talk about um, reforming the Green Fund all the time. The question you have to ask yourself is, what is the objective of the reform? Because if the objective of the reform is the environmental impact, to increase the environmental impact of the fund, if that's the primary objective, then making it more accessible only to micro and small and medium sized enterprises is not necessarily the best idea. It, you have to make it available to everyone because part of the issue with making it more available to micro and small enterprises is that it, it gives off this impression that the Green Fund and environmental, environmental sustainability is only the concern of a small group of people who are really passionate about the environment. No, what some people are saying is if, if it's really about if environmental sustainability is everybody's responsibility, then make large companies, like if, if, if Massey can access the Green Fund and do a massive project, then the environment benefits. But that's political suicide. And, and, and also, people are very, very protective of the Green Fund for good reason, because the Green Fund has another function, right? Which is building the capacity of small and medium-sized enterprises and helping people in, in rural areas that don't have access to other traditional funding. The question now is one of focus. What do you actually want to achieve? What's your objective? That is the question right now that we are faced with in the subcommittee. In terms of even in terms of delivery and implementation, when it comes to village, village councils, or it comes to having an implementation unit in the prime minister's office, regardless of what the issue is, the, right now the main question.
person that, that they, they're grappling with is one of focus, one of what are the real objectives that we want to achieve mm-hmm. after this, mm-hmm. right? And that, that really um, has implications for what yeah. we do. So that, I hope that answers the question. Well, it stimulates conversation. So I think, um, you know, getting that direction, that focus, so that everybody can be um, working towards that. Um, how do we get there? Who makes that decision? Um, surely not the 22 and the subcommittees. Um, so let's, let's play on that a little bit. And I'll throw it out to Zakia next. Um, there are questions related to how can civil society play a stronger role? Um, do we need more formalized mechanisms and so on? How can right now civil society um, have a voice in, in that direction, in that decision? You're, you're muted, I think, Zakia. No. I'm muted. No, no, you're good. Yes. The, um, I went back to the beginning and looked at the aim is now. And I mean, I was really happy to hear the, the, the Prime Minister understanding that there is need for change, that this, the new society, as we go forward, it has to be inclusive, it has to be resilient, it has to be people-centered, it has to be sustainable. And out of that discussion, there are going to be a, quite a bit of ideals put forward and so on. But from where I sit, the challenge continues to remain, and this is what you're speaking to, is the how. Because even as we are having a lot of discussions, the people maybe in Mayaro or in Blanchichez or in um, um, Toko, they are having their discussion, but they are, they are, but it is related to what is happening in their community. We can only build a new society from the community up. If each of our communities are functioning with, the, with these principles of inclusiveness, resilience, sustainability, people-centered approach to decision-making, then we would have a country that is functioning like that. So the, the fact that all of our efforts tend to be at trying to create policies, which trying to develop um, new ways of doing things, which we write down and we, um, and we keep in beautiful documents, which we, um, you know, we file, yes, we have done this, and then we can tick boxes and say that we have done it. But the practical actions to change the behavior of the people in the society and would allow us to have this new vision or, or this different pathway has to start within our communities. And we would understand when we go there that the communities, they are very much aware of all the things that we, of which we are speaking. Uh, but according to Akuswa, they may speak it in a different language. They know how climate change is impacting their communities. They know how the non-diversified economy is impacting their communities. They understand all of those things. But if the decisions that are being made is not helping them to fix what is happening in their community first, then we are always going to be striving towards ideal, but not knowing or understanding how to do it. So I just want to strongly advocate, how can we develop the institutions in the community that can be strengthened so that they have the power to make decisions which can be fed into, let us say, at the level of the corporations and eventually at the level of the government. There is a process called participatory budgeting which follows that kind of a trajectory where the pers- each village, each community decides what is the budget for their community. And then they go and they try to defend that at the level of the corporation. And then that is t- taken up right up to the level of government. So that when decisions are made, all the, the issues from people from the bottom up are taken into consideration. And I think those are, this is where we are weakest. And I think this is where we as civil society organizations, where we can, and based on the work that we do, need to direct our efforts. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. And I think that's the importance of starting at the community level and linking yes. to the regional yes. level and national level. Um, you know, it's clearly going to be challenging 
Yes. <laughs> Given the current mode of operation where we are um, yes. looking at immediate response, how can we factor that in immediate direction setting? And then also the longer term recovery and creating the institution, yeah. as you see. Um, and she wanted to ask a course. Uh, you know, yeah, sorry. No, I was just saying, Nicole, that the thinking that has to become incorporated into the thinking as yeah. well for those yeah. who are discussing the future. Yeah. 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 And decentralizing um, a lot, you yes. know, bringing decisions, um, decision making from the community level up. Um, to the center, not at the center, diffusing yes. down, right? And then not to the community. <laughs> yeah, I think linked to that, I want to go back to our course for and say, you know, how can we bring community level, micro and small enterprises into the decisions and into the, the solutions? Um, you know, Karen said it's so important we see success when we have a common vision we have co-created um, and where we all know what we're working towards and all can do it in ministries and so on. But, but do you think, you know, micro enterprises and small enterprises see themselves as contributing to this development direction in the country? Um, how can we get their voices in and help them to be, you know, part of that solution? I think right now, most of them don't feel a part of any decision making or solution because of how the approach to their growth has been. So it hasn't been from the community up. It has been either politically driven or it has been uh, what is trending in the world or it has been what funds are available from a funder as sexy. So it hasn't been a community coming with a, a plan, a program, for the most part, some of them do, but it hasn't been where communities who has, you know, they've, they've set themselves up with a, a clear intention and a clear purpose and they come into town or to, they come into these decision makers for access to finance and, and have been told, yes, this is a good idea and we will, we will take the toolkit and amend it and, and, and use the tools in it based on what you say. It hasn't been like that traditionally. It has been what we go in there and tell them is working and what they need. So that trust is gone. So the, 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 the how has to be rebuilding the trust. And the how has to be allowing the communities to have a say, not just in lip service. And we talk about uh, bringing the informal into the formal. And maybe that's not the answer in the way that it is. Because a lot of of rural communities don't want to go to banks. And we have we've seen examples throughout the world where people use mobile money very effectively. So they, they uh, I think as Omar said, the science is there. So how can we take that and use it in the communities? Because if we keep telling the communities, this is what you need, this is what you need, this is what you need, then they start be becoming resentful of it. So the key is really to start from the, the, the communities and, and, and organizing them in a way, or they're, they're really organized, but looking at what they have and seeing how we can change the way we measure it. Because if we, if we keep measuring it by what we know that came from somewhere else, then continue with this problem. So it sounds simple, but it's really effective. You see that building of trust? That is a bridge. How you build that trust is it's very simple. You listen. You listen first and you, you choose one or two things and you hold yourself accountable. So if the big intention, as Karen said, the big intention has been decided, you show a community, 
this is how it links with what you are doing. You show them it, and that will catch on. So I don't know if that answers your question. I'm not looking for an answer. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. I, I to, discussion. <laughs> discussion. I wanted yeah. to throw it to Omar because I know the Cropper Foundation, like Canary, tries very hard to work with local communities um, and really make that link to the national policy level and connect local communities um, to national issues. Um, you know, Omar, what's your experience in, in how this can be done in a practical way? Can civil society play a role? Um, you know, and therefore, how can civil society position itself to, to be part of this roadmap development and then implementation? There's a question on, you know, should we improve civil society representation on the committee? You know, what do you think about, about what role civil society can play in all of this? Yeah, well, I think a couple of things. Um, in our most recent, you know, the third year of, of, a, of some work that we're doing with you know, close to 30 community groups and NGOs around Trinidad and Tobago and uh, around the environmental governance of extractive industries specifically. And, uh, you know, one of the key parts of that work at the beginning was just hearing how disenfranchised these groups were or felt within the, um, the entire environmental um, regulatory framework. They felt completely left out. They felt completely bulldozed when they attend the so-called consultations. Um, you know, people come in suits and have fancy PowerPoint presentations with very complex data. And then, you, you, again, as, as, as Akio or, or Koso said, you take a box and you move on. Um, and a, a huge part of this work, we, we, won't, we are not planning to make them geoscience, uh, petroleum geoscientists or, or, or whatever. But the, the key part of that was just bringing them together for them to understand that they're not alone. And, uh, you know, we, as we assume sometimes that Trinidad and Tobago is a small place here and you could drive from one side to the other in no time at all. But people mm -hmm. in Fishing Pond, for example, had, would say, you know, had no idea that somebody in Lopino was going through the same thing. Oh, you know, I had I had no idea that you know people in Point Fortin put up a fight against the same exact thing a couple of years ago and won. You know, because people have their own lives to live and and they move on. <clears throat> and I think a key part was just bringing these these communities together so they could understand their power in numbers. And uh, you know, it's worked so well. You know, so far we've had communities working together even outside of the program you know, helping, helping each other write to uh, members of parliament, going to a public consultation together so they have support. And, uh, you know, in this small little microcosm, it's worked so well so far. And, uh, you know, I think as, like, as Karen said also, and uh, Akosa is that, you know, and this is something I've learned recently in this whole idea of, you know, sense-making. People sometimes, and I think us as scientists and you know, working in this field, we, we're so sort of burdened by the need for accuracy. And, you know, um, that in many cases, plausible is enough for people to make a story and to guide their, their work. So there are people in these groups who just, you know, we still have a WhatsApp group and they still post fake news, but that's not the point. The point is that they are there for one another to support one another because they, they've bought into the, the story. Um, that we that we've been selling to them, <laughs> and uh, so yes, I think once we are able to give them the, a story that they're able to buy into, they will take it and run with it um, in all their different structures, be it community businesses, community governance institutions, whatever. Um, but again, it's just, we need to have a single <laughs> direction um, because, like many communities, they're just fed up with multiple things being thrown up at them. And like anyone else, they might just throw their hands up and just move on with their life. So mm -hmm. we need to, to craft that single story. Um, and coming back to what um, Zakia and I know Nicole, you know, we've spoken about this is that, you know, where, the, where is, should this direction come from? Because any economic or development direction as partisan will have a five-year limit. 
And uh, something like this needs 10 years, 15 years um, of focus. So how could we as a country come up with that? Mm -hmm. um, sh is that going, should that be led by civil society, the business sector, you know, the non-partisan sectors, uh, mm -hmm. which we then get the political parties to sign on to? Um, otherwise, we're just going to have fluctuations between who doesn't want to do something because it was tabled by the last government. And, uh, you know, we're going to have these multiple things being thrown at us um, every five years. Um, so I think one, one, the communities will do what they have to do. But again, like anyone else, we have, you know, we have to work with them to come up with a direction that we all have to work together towards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I mean, I think I'm going to throw it back to Karen, not putting him on the spot, but you're, you're in the middle of, of these discussions. And the Prime Minister gave the committee, you know, six, a matter of weeks to come up with a plan. Um, and, you know, to what extent, can, you know, is that process a reasonable process for the kind of listening that we heard um, is needed and, and that works, you know, to gather those voices to come to consensus on direction, you know, um, to what extent can we use this opportunity to catalyze a bigger conversation, you know, um, any thoughts, Karen, on, you know, the positioning of this roadmap and this, this core committee who I'm very sympathetic towards actually um, what they've been given to do. <laughs> um, how can that catalyze a real meaningful discussion uh, across society? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think um, without commenting on the composition of the committee, I know that the Prime Minister has well, given the committee the uh, ability to pull as many people as they want in. And I think that they have been doing that. Um, I keep hearing about different NGOs, CBOs, business organizations that have just been pulled into these different um, uh, subcommittees, like, like ours, of course. Uh, Canaries represented on our subcommittee. And you have, I think what's happening now is you have an opportunity to, to gain buy-in for a singular task and a singular vision. I think the real challenge in practice are vested interests, self-interests, and party politics. I think those three things combine to cripple all of our intentions. Um, and I'm just talking just real talk, um, not trying to butt it up too much. In terms of, in terms of I, I'm going to backwards order. In terms of <laughs> party politics, um, one member of the opposition, Vassan Barat is on one of the subcommittees now. Um, they tried to get um, another representative in the form of Bojra Tiwari from the opposition to sit on one of the subcommittees so that they get more buy-in. That was rejected by the opposition. So. Um, and I was on the phone with the opposition senator yesterday, um, just really trying to, if we can break down the antagonism, because my, my point is really simple. Climate change is not a UNC issue or a PNM issue. COVID is not a UNC issue or a PNM issue. These things do not respect our race. They don't respect our political affiliations. We all have to get over ourselves, get over our world affiliations, and we have to be Trinidadian and uh, Trinbagonian first. Um, more than that, we have to be global citizens because these are global challenges, right? Um, and so the ability to kind of shed um, your own party um, allegiance it has been um, a challenge in the past. This is going back five years even. Um, and and it, the same thing goes for vested and personal interest. I teach climate policy at the University of the West Indies. I teach climate change policy. And I, I teach it at a graduate level. And every year I, I have this interesting exercise where I take a real investment opportunity. Not a theoretical one. I take an investment opportunity from an actual, <laughs> a real life scenario where somebody is bringing money into the country. Right? We had one instance where this person was bringing an investment into the country. I don't want to get too specific because I don't want to get in trouble and it's being recorded. But it was going to impact uh, one of our important natural resources. Um, and water was the, um, the, uh, was the resource that was going to be impacted. Because many people here would know that we have aquaculture. And this person was saying, listen, it would impact it, but 
think about how many jobs that you'll be creating. And so I put it to my students every year. What if you, one of your parents was one of the people that was going to benefit from one of these jobs? Would you still say no to the investment, even though it would adversely impact the water supply? And every year we all fail. Most of the students say, I mean, I need to eat now. You know what I mean? And so, but <laughs> part of the reason, and so part of the thing that we have been trying to work on more um, is trying to get the state to think in terms of if you have a vision that people can buy into, part of the issue is people can only choose from A if you only present them with A. So if you say to somebody, listen, you need to stop fishing this much um, because you're, you're depleting the, 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 um, the resources. Then they're going to say, like, why, should I, why should I do that? That's going to affect my, my livelihood. Um, but if you show them, actually, if you stop doing this, there are alternatives, B, C, D, that you can do when you're not doing this. You understand? And that is the real power behind what we're trying to stimulate in terms of diversification. Right? And that's why, I mean, part of my bigger problem now is that um, even when it comes to stimulating innovation, right, in our country, part of the problem is that many people may not know this, but actually in our innovation system, which we do have in Trinidad, is currently located not in the ministry that, that these are small and medium-sized enterprises, or in the Ministry of Trade, it's currently located in the Ministry of Education. Part of what that means is that all the talk that, um, that when, when Zakia was talking about working with village councils, and when Akusso was talking about, you know, um, going to the communities, the actual instruments that are in that, that are resourced that people who have money to help people build businesses and to get funding for to scale their businesses and to get funding for innovation right now that's geared towards university graduates period so if you are not a university graduate those funds are not really geared towards you right now and so what i'm trying to do is trying to get policymakers to think beyond there's this, this one, you know, so, so on the one side, that's why I said we need to be focused. And if we are going to be focused on, let's say, economic empowerment, then economic empowerment, mean, empowerment means, listen, yes, you're going, you're going to have the green economy, and the green economy means that we have this framework and everybody has to respect it. But if you are telling somebody no to hunting, it, which is a big thing in Trinidad, if you tell somebody no to 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 fishing that also catches turtles. If you if you tell somebody no to the to, to new extractive industries, you have to be able to present them with a yes to something else. And usually that's where we fall short. You understand? So right now we say no to communities. And of uh, course, I gave the example of the rural businesswoman. We would say no to her, yeah, you know, because she's not. She may not be a university graduate. Blessed be if she is. She get you. But if she's not. The question is, you're saying no to this, but what, can, what are we saying yes to? And that the reason, we're not saying yes to very much, and part of the reason for that is, again, the lack of focus and the lack of bipartisan agreement. I'll stop there. I think I, I hope that answers yeah. some of the questions. Yeah. And really switching from, from a regulatory mindset of what can't you do to an enabling and a, and a revealing opportunity. And exactly. A exactly. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Karen, always um, exciting to hear you. Um, I'm watching our time. <laughs> what I want to do is I do want to circle back and give all the panelists um, a chance to make one last brief um, comment. You know, what, what point would you really like to, to us to, to go home with? Um, was that Omar who wanted to say something? Oh, I just want, want to make a quick thing about the regulatory and enabling. Mm. Um, one key thing that I think, I know Lisa Martinez had asked it in the chat mm. and the Q&A about short term, you know, six to 12 months. One thing that we have to make sure is that we do not um, rush it and try to become too enabling right now, which means that we, like we've seen in some other countries where they've relaxed environmental regulations mm -hmm. to promote economic action so you know we already have issues with transparency and accountability we need to make very sure that we don't further um make those areas grayer right. um for the sake of short-term wins yeah uh, yeah so that's one thing that i think is fantastic i'm seeing thumbs up from karen um fantastic point um of course so would, would you like to hit us with a, a point to take home 
You're still muted, I think. Hold on. Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, I wanted to say that there are communities that are doing wonderful small business businesses and, and innovation and entrepreneurship. And I think that for us to improve on that involves two things. One, I think the overall aim is to build a better community and that will transform itself into a better country. And the second thing is to leverage and work with what they are doing to improve, to improve it and to, to showcase it so that other communities are just as Omar said, people in Point don't know what people in, uh, I can't remember the place you're called, but showcase what they're doing, leverage on it and, and keep in mind that all we want to do is build better citizens and build better communities. And I think if we build better citizens, the, the, the question of will it affect my water supply will not be a, a, a big question because better citizens know, they know that sacrifice is involved and they know, they know that there's not just one way to have income coming in, do mm -hmm. that. So I think our role is to focus on building better citizens and that has to come from the communities and it has to come from our education system. And it has to come with us respecting what is already there and building on that. And that involves changing how we measure and mm -hmm. keeping that you cannot dismiss where we are. I mean, we are in a situation where women are running most of the households in Trinidad. So if you do anything ignoring that, we are in trouble. From a single woman um, household, a single mother household, yes, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, Zakia, what did you like us to take home? Um, I wanted to just um, comment on the concern that you had reflect that you had indicated, um, Nicole, about how we can perhaps begin to look at this engagement of communities. And every time I think of that, I always reflect on the capacity that government show when it is election time. They are able to get to every single household but the message then is vote for me. If we are able to mobilize that same kind of apparatus towards with, with a different goal, to get information, to find out who are the persons in the community who really need help. What are the goals of this community? What are their needs? And how can we help them strengthen themselves towards uh, achieving those? Or how can the government now in its role be able to strengthen each community. Because according to our KUSWA, if we have, again, I'm gonna go back to our words, inclusive, resilient, sustainable, and um, communities that are all um, engaging, then we have a country that is like that. So I think that the focus on communities is possible. And I think if government wants to engage communities, they know how. And the, the other point about a national development plan, one of the and which oh, the point that Omar made, one of the ways that Jamaica has been able to address that is making their national development plan a national strategy which cannot be changed. So if they have a 15, 20 year national development plan, that does not change with governments. And therefore we have to get our governments to come together to agree, our parties to agree that we need a one a national development plan, of course, developed in the right approach through proper engagement, proper stakeholder engagement from the bottom up. And that that plan is the plan to which all our government, uh, um, you know, that's what they strive to, to, to make into a reality. Of course, each plans can be tweaked nationally, but, it, but people, our national development plan cannot be a, a, a party's manifesto. So we have to change that, uh, that um, kind of perception, and I think that that is also possible. So those, um, that's my closing words. Thank you. 
Thank you, um, Zakia and, and all the panelists. I'm going to wrap this up now. Um, you know, I think we've really looked at all four messages, but really come to the comments and, uh, you know, idea that we need to have a collaborative process of developing a common um, vision, direction that can guide all of our actions. Um, and, and that's the real, the, the real crux of the matter. And overcoming our own challenges and barriers to getting together collectively um, and, and debating the trade-offs, um, looking at you know um, developing consensus. So thanks to all the panelists um, very much for that. And what I want to do is hand over to Sasha um, Jatan Singh, who has been paying attention. Um, thank you everybody for and putting questions on your comments in the chat and the Q and A. And Sasha has been tracking and is going to share some, some key points that, that she has heard from, from this discussion. Um, Sasha? Hi, thank you, Nicole. Oh, I just wanted to know if everybody could hear me. Yes, we can. <laughs> thank you, Zakia. Well, I thought that this discussion that we've had, our first We Roadmap, our first virtual national conversation on on how we could move forward and what are the recommendations for our roadmap to recovery has been quite informative, engaging, and has really enabled uh, civil society, academia, government, um, private sector, and even citizens who take an interest to come together and, and outline what are our priorities, our our possible solutions and our recommendations. And some of the key points that were raised in this really excellent discussion, um, both in the chat question and answer and from the panelists is that real transformation must be driven by people-centered and inclusive policies, but it will only happen if practical actions at the community level occur to support local economic development. And also we see the need for decentralizing governance and institutionalizing participatory and bottom-up approaches in order to do this moving forward. Um, we've also seen the need for, for, the, for citizens and civil society and to come together with the policymakers, with the private sector to work together and develop what are the viable solutions now and to the and into the future and we've discussed the need for looking at interactive mechanisms to support such a meaningful engagement and inclusion of stakeholders in decision making for the recovery roadmap and for our national development priorities and plans in the medium and long term we're looking at new mechanisms for engagement not just the token consultations that we're used to so how can we reform and transform moving forward to really encourage this, this new, I would say, um, model for, for more inclusive governance for Trinidad and Tobago? What we also uh, discussed was the need to move away from this notion of a one-size-fits-all approach to now developing a suite of tools, policies, and programs which will support small and micro enterprises, CSOs and local communities in being part of this discussion and the implementation of what is um, sustainable economic growth while also supporting leaving no one behind and also maintaining the quality and integrity of our natural resources. And that is quite important to, to have this, this moving away from a panacea, a one-size-fits-all approach to something that is now relevant and something that is, that is viable for, that meets the needs for, of various communities, of various marginalized groups um, who have been excluded in the past as we move forward uh, with, this, with this recovery. What we've heard also is the need to incorporate natural and social capital in economic decision making for our recovery roadmap and in the future and what we need is integrated approaches to achieve real sustainable development we've been hearing and we've been seeing that we have the science that we have enough data and many tools have been piloted so far um, and now we need to have that willingness 
and that drive to take things forward. We can't continue to have pilot projects, but we need to now have the commitment and this focus from policymakers and from the government to start incorporating these new tools of economic valuation, if it's natural capital accounting, if it's carbon, um, climate budgeting, for example, into how we make decisions on, on our economic development and growth. What we've also discussed is that innovation and diversification are key but they must be done in ways that respect local and traditional knowledge and practices. And this roadmap and our medium and long-term development plan has to be for people, with people, and by people. So definitely that, that, that notion of, of people-centered is key to any sort of, of um, recovery plan of, of our roadmap for Trinidad and Tobago. And what I, I thought was one of the most um, poignant recommendations or insights was that a success, a successfully implemented and developed roadmap is that we all need to have a common vision of what it is we want and what it is we want to achieve. And everybody needs to have clear rules and responsibilities in implementing and in monitoring and evaluating this roadmap. And what Dr. Niles has stated is that we've seen the success of the national COVID-19 response that the government has taken and that it was laser focused and we had continued communication. And if it is that we have our recovery mood map that is focused, that, that really highlights what are the objectives, the implications, and the opportunities to really transform our economy and society, then we will have a, we will definitely be on the path to success. But this could only happen if civil society, if citizens, if academia, um, if private sector are able to come together and proactively use existing and new tools, structures, and mechanisms such as if it's Zoom, if it's online submission platforms, if it's using social media to continue advocating what their key messages and solutions are, if it's going to the, the media to really get their, their messages and recommendations out because we really need to be part of the conversation with government and policymakers on what our roadmap should be and what our vision for, the develop, for our national development plan in the future should be for Trinidad and Tobago. And that is what, that is how this roadmap that Canary um, sees and our, our recommendations and our inputs in it is for the, uh, the recovery roadmap to be people-centered, to be sustainable and to be resilient. And I think these are the key points that came up in this discussion um, and it really, it, it, it was quite exciting to hear everybody's views, listening to the questions, seeing the comments on the chats and really realizing that we have similar, we have similar principles and concepts that we want any sort of, of roadmap for Trinidad and Tobago to be. And uh, do, I, I just wanted to say that that was quite exciting to have this, this opportunity, to have this virtual conversation together with you all. Um, in terms of the next steps of what is going to happen after this We Roadmap webinar is that, that we will keep feeding information to the, to the um, committee and I definitely hope that you all are able to do that as well using the existing mechanisms that are in place such as the online submission platform on the TT Connect website to continue to submit your comments and recommendations to the committee. And also uh, Dr. Niles and I are members of the subcommittee on retooling, reforming and transforming the economy. And we will be sharing the key messages and recommendations from this, this webinar with the rest of the subcommittee to help inform our work because now we're hearing what are the priorities, what are some of the solutions, what are some of the opportunities that we could take in developing or providing recommendations to the Prime Minister on what the recovery roadmap should be. Also, um, immediate steps from Canary is that we will be um, releasing a media release and we will be continuing 
outreach through social media and our networks. We also will be sharing the links to the, this presentation as well as the recording of our webinar on our website on, on our social media platform. So definitely feel free to share. Um, what we also want to do is to encourage you all to continue this conversation and join other conversations on how we all can develop a viable and an inclusive roadmap for Trinidad and Tobago. So we definitely hope that others in, Tr in TNT could continue these conversations, um, you know, either on Facebook, on Twitter, Skype, WhatsApp. We definitely want you all to continue to collaborate, share ideas, and develop a shared vision for how TNT's recovery should be. And we want to encourage you all to use the hashtag we roadmap when you're sharing this because it's not our it's not a canary um hashtag by any means but we want to make sure that that the any sort of recommendations and so on are coming from from a place where it's for the people by the people and with people and that's why this we roadmap hashtag is a nice way of expressing that these recommendations are are really focused on being people-centered and inclusive and, and sustainable as well. So these are our next steps. Um, I don't know if, if Nicole, you want to do the thank yous or I could continue. You can continue. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, everybody. Okay. So I just want to say thank you, everybody, for attending the webinar. It was quite engaging, quite interactive. I want to thank all the panelists for providing their views and really being able to, to respond to the questions, to the comments from the, the audience. I mean, some of them were quite provocative. And I think now we have some, some new ways and new solutions of, of, of how our recovery roadmap can be. Um, what we have at the end of this webinar when you leave the meeting is that we have an evaluation survey, a very short survey for you all to complete. So we'd really appreciate that since um, this is actually the first time that, that Canary is using Zoom webinar. <laughs> so we definitely would appreciate your feedback on it. And I just want to say thank you all for, for being part of this national conversation together on how the recovery roadmap can and should be for Trinidad and Tobago. And we hope that you will continue to keep this conversation alive in the future. Thank you very much. And thank you all to the Canary staff as well who have been providing a lot of support for the webinar and, um, and the entire and, uh, back end process. Thank you all. Uh, there is a short survey as you leave, you will get prompted. So attendees, we thank you in advance for completing the survey. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care. Okay. Thank you.